morning, everyone, and welcome. The numbers of people uh, seem to have settled down. There may be a few more that join, but I think it's just after 10, so I'm uh, going to make a start. Uh, welcome to this Emerging from the Pandemic seminar, um, jointly hosted by RMP, Aon, and Forbes. I'm Siobhan Hardy from Forbes Solicitors, and I'm going to be chairing the webinar today. It's good to see so many of you connecting remotely, and obviously I can't see you all today, although hopefully you can see uh, me and uh, the speakers as they uh, as they speak. As we do actually emerge more fully from the pandemic, I really, really can't wait to see you all in person, something I'm really looking forward to. First visit to um, a beer garden last weekend, although in, in the cold here in uh, Halifax, where I live, uh, I did have to wear a hat and scarf, but it's gloriously sunny today, so hopefully this weekend's beer garden trip will be feel a bit more like we are actually emerging from the pandemic. The session's been recorded today, and um, so that will be available uh, afterwards, subject to the, uh, the speaker's approval. Um, and we're also going to share the slides with you after the event as well, so don't worry about scribbling down too much. Um, if you have any questions, could you type them into the Q&A function? We've uh, um, got that set up, and we'll try and get to them at the end of each session. If we don't manage to address your question, don't worry, we will come back to you fully after the seminar with a follow-up email on any questions that are raised. As many of you know, Forbes, um, RMP and Aon have been used to hosting a, an annual event at around Christmas time in Manchester uh, over the last several years. And of course the pandemic put paid to that as it has with many other events over the last 12 months or so. But we didn't want to miss the opportunity of um, presenting um, our expertise to you all and um, in thinking about the, the theme of what this should be this year, emerging from the pandemic seemed to hit the right note. It enables us to address the risks and claims issues that have arisen and will continue to, to arise as um, the results of lockdown and as lockdown eases. Um, uh, but it also enables us to strike a bit more of an optimistic note about uh, the, the restrictions gradually being lifted and us getting down to um, a little bit more of a, a normal interactive uh, world again. Um, so instead of our usual larger uh, one-off large scale event, we've decided to split this into three separate sessions. And today's is kicking off uh, the three sessions. The save the date note for the next session is the 17th of September and um, details of that will be coming out in due course. And, um, and the third session, we are going to take a view on when that's going to be based around how things are developing around the pandemic. <clears throat> Excuse me. Today's session itself is in three parts. We're going to be looking at the impact of the pandemic on a changing risk profile and what that looks like in the changed work environment and also how to deal with some of the claims that uh, arise as a result. I'll introduce each of the speakers <clears throat> as, they, um, as they are about to speak and we're kicking off today with the ever popular Robert Redford of the insurance world, as he likes to be known. Um, Phil's going to look at the evolution of uh, risk profile pre and post pandemic. Phil's career began in 1986 with uh, Municipal Mutual, and he worked at two of their branches before joining the broking world, uh, actually Aon, uh, in 1992, where he stayed for 12 years, working as part of their national public sector team. He joined RMP in 2004, where he was responsible for delivery of uh, service in the north of England and Scotland, as well as managing his own client accounts. Since 2012, he's been RMP's National Development Director. His specialisms include risk financing and tender management, and he's become a recognised speaker at Alarm and Insurance and Risk Conferences. Phil's emotional and financial well-being is taken care by the fact that he is, one, a Manchester City fan, and two, has two daughters, and he's going to leave you to decide which party has the greater influence on what. Thank you very much, Phil, if you can take it from there. Un unmute yourself. Uh, thanks, uh, Siobhan. Uh, I don't know about the Robert Redford of the uh, insurance industry. I've been told I've got a face for radio, so um, this is, that's a compliment. Uh, but welcome, everybody, and thanks for joining the session. Uh, I think, as you probably know, if you've heard me speak previously, my personal style it is very much one of face-to-face -face presentation, but we try and do the best we can with the webinar. We've got about 30 minutes or so, so I'll make sure we try and give you something to take from my first session, which is looking at the sort of changing risk profiles that we think is going to occur sort of pre and post pandemic. It's something that we're certainly interested in as, as a company. Uh, I have to say, uh, 30 minutes, it's very difficult for me to try and do justice to the topic in that uh, time frame. 
If there is anything that you would like to follow up, uh, if you're an RMP client, by all means do so, and we'd be really happy to speak to you uh, uh, away from the, the session today. Okay, uh, Christy, can you change the first slide, please? Uh, oh, sorry, and the, the next one, please, just so we've got the points of discussion. Yeah, so I think the things we're going to try and cover now is a little bit about the sort of pre-pandemic risk profile, what it's going to look like possibly post-pandemic, uh, what that evolving risk profile is, what we think you as an employer need to be aware of, uh, and then some tips on risk assessment, which will be the first part of the, the tips we're going to offer in the trilogy of sessions that we're doing with Forbes and Aon. Uh, thanks, Christy. Yeah, so I think, you know, pre-pandemic, uh, we, we pretty much knew what the working environment was like. Uh, it, may have, it may not have been uh, perfect, and there was certainly a move towards more agile working. But by and large, uh, organisations knew pretty much where their employees were, or at least where they should have been. Uh, more importantly, they had control and influence over their working environment and the manner in which that work was delivered and how they undertook it. Uh, I think without doubt, agile working certainly loosens the employer's grip on these points and in turn could open the door and shed more daylight on the possibility of liability claims emerging. Uh, thanks, Christy. If we can turn the, turn the slide. Yeah, oh, sorry, yeah, uh, Matt, yeah. Uh, uh, I think as, as the working environment does evolve, uh, it's fair to say employees will have the same visibility and control where that work has been delivered within the office. Uh, but where we've got agile working, I think one question we'd ask is how many employees have undertaken some form of risk assessment uh, for the home workers? It, it does feel almost uh, overwhelming, really, the, the amount of work that could be involved in it. Many have left it to employees to do a self-assessment. How many employees have been trained in undertaking risk assessment could be open to, to question. And it'll be interesting to see in years to come if that will prove to be an adequate defence against future claims. Uh, and also, what should the frequency of assessment be? I've been a home worker now for 16, uh, going, going on 17 years, and I've done one personal risk assessment in that time. And I've worked in one, two, three, four, five different working environments in that, in that period. Uh, I, I think a key point as well, and it's something my, my wife is now working from home, and it's something I noticed, is how many employees will balance the aesthetics of the home working station with the practical uh, uh, basic ergonomic principles of a sound working environment. In other words, will the chair match the wallpaper? So in terms of agile working, I think for the, the purposes of uh, today's session, uh, I'll give a little definition there of what agile working will mean. Uh, I think in our session, primarily think of it as working from home, well, agile working is not just working from home, it's working from anywhere. It's a hotel room, it's a, a coffee shop, it's someone else's offices, someone else's house. Uh, it could be a, a train station, an airport. It's anywhere, basically, where you can replicate the office environment and deliver uh, your role. Uh, thanks, uh, Christy. Uh, I thought it was an interesting clip from the Daily Mail in, in January, uh, a picture of a uh, sheikh who's working in the desert. Uh, I did think he's probably got better uh, Wi-Fi connection than I have here with my BT uh, home hub. But it just shows, uh, and I thought that's actually one of the best visual pictures I've seen of uh, home working or agile working. Uh, thanks, Christy. Christy, can we, can we change it? Oh, yeah, thanks, yeah. Uh, just an interesting point, actually. Uh, this is a cystic we come across earlier in the year. Currently, out of a population or a working population of around about 32 and a half million, we've got a, a, apparently 50% of people are working from home or working uh, agile. Uh, it, it was noticeable in the summer of 2020. Uh, I certainly saw three councils approach us and ask us uh, could staff work abroad? And would they be insured? And effectively, what this was was people who were looking to maybe had the benefit of a second uh, home. Uh, looking to, to basically spend the summer period working from there. We, we took quite a strong view on this and we said, yeah, we're happy to insure them. But what we're not going to insure is the journey to and from the uh, location because it wasn't an authorised trip in the sense that the employer was taking out travel insurance and the, and the employee was asking them to go and work there. This was basically people making use of working in a different environment. So we, we weren't prepared to insure the trip. And we also said that we wouldn't cover 
any accidents which occurred in the uh, location because we had no influence over the quality or management of the risk. Neither did the employer. For all we know, it could have been a building site uh, that they were working on. Uh, and, and nobody come back and, uh, and argued about those points. But it's interesting to consider where does, li- where does the employer's uh, liability stop and start? Uh, thanks, Christy. So we've got this uh, evolving risk profile. Uh, many employees have sort of gone from a fully assessed working environment to working at home uh, on a dining room table or something they bought from Ikea, if indeed you can actually get it uh, get it there. Uh, I'm, I've been reliably informed that, uh, that, sorry, that chiropractors, osteopaths and physiotherapists have never been as busy. And in some cases, acupuncturists, there's one in Stadley Bridge that we can recommend uh, by all accounts. I've never been so busy dealing with back, shoulder, wrist, neck, joint injuries. Uh, I, I know myself, my, my role as working from home, uh, normally uh, pre, pre the pandemic, I'd have done maybe two, two and a half days at home, maybe uh, during the week. Uh, if I had five days, it would have been a luxury. Since I've been working at home permanently, I, I've now developed a problem in my right shoulder, which I'm trying to deal with. And that's simply because of the way I sit the way my mouse is positioned and the additional work pressure I've put up on there. Uh, general health and safety, slips and trips, who's responsible for the hole in the carpet? The employer is responsible for the working environment of the employee. Uh, where does the, you know, this is where the risk assessment could become crucial. Uh, uh, something that we have had a big push on with QBE is we're very keen, as I know all organisations are, dealing with uh, mental well-being, uh, uh, the concept of isolation and stress. My, my personal view is I think it's going to be sort of two or three years before we begin to see potential claims developing in this area. And it's going to be difficult to, to as it is in any of these situations, to work out where the employer's responsibility stops and, uh, and, and starts. Uh, uh, as it were. Uh, I, how do you manage productivity? You know, uh, is it a number of emails somebody produces? Is it a number of words that they type? Because we all know an email can be one word or can be, uh, be a thousand. Uh, do we adopt what Volkswagen did, uh, as I understand it, where they stopped uh, employees having the ability to send emails after five o'clock and receive them before uh, eight o'clock in the morning uh, around it? And I think these are all going to be factors. I think there's a this sort of unwritten balance. And in fact, in some cases, people have seen it as, as, as a written part of uh, what they're doing, which is, you know, this work-life balance. You know, if you need to do the lawn, you can do the lawn, you can walk the dog, you can pick the kids up, you can go and do what you need to do during the day as long as the work is done. When, when does that stop? Someone told me one of the major accounting houses have introduced a sort of zero hours type contract, basically. Uh, sorry, employees don't need to be, they've got no fixed hours as long as the job is done. Uh, the difficulty is, 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 like I say, is how do you manage and monitor what is uh, what is happening? Uh, uh, I'll put a point on there on career career progression. Uh, I, I'm probably fortunate enough to be in the uh, the, the uh, spring of my career, uh, maybe the autumn, possibly even a bit of snow with the winter. But uh, when I started out in my career, it was the best. You know, I absolutely really got on with everybody, but I could see where the competition was for the next p- promotion within the company I was working for. You knew who the people were. You could see what was going on. How do you do that when you're working from home? How do you get yourself noticed? It's maybe fine now where people have quite a bit of uh, uh, contact through pre-lockdown, but for new starters, how do they uh, work for it? Uh, greater talent pool for recruitment. If people can work from home and you're working, can people in Cornwall apply for a job in Greater Manchester? Uh, how does an employer uh, stop it happening? How do you shake uh, these things out? How long will an employee stay in the job? Will they feel that they've got a, a commitment to it, as it were? It'd be interesting to see what it could look like in, in 20 years' time. And I think these were all factors which were already being accelerated uh, in any event, but uh, uh, pre-lockdown. But I think uh, lockdown has just moved them uh, forward much quicker. Uh, uh, as it were. Uh, equally, I think taking a balanced view on it, the, we've certainly seen a drop in claim numbers. We've seen fewer highways claims, fewer motor claims with less road and traffic. I'm informed in China that when they lifted lockdown, there was a 400% increase in RTAs because uh, obviously people have uh, not got used to, uh, to to driving again, as it were. So it, it's interesting. Unfortunately, we've not seen a dip in cat claims. Uh, cyclists appear to be a major problem on the, on the highways. And I'd be interested to see what's going to happen with things like the electric scooters and the, and the direction they go in. One of our, probably our largest, second largest reported RTA does involve somebody on, a, on an electronic scooter. 
uh, as it were. So, as I say, these are all features pre-pandemic. They've just been accelerated forward. Uh, at weekends now, everyone's pouring into the park space and public spaces more and more. Will that place greater stress on those pathways of play equipment and the like? Uh, as any organisation of local authorities adapted the inspection patterns to reflect the greater usage and, and maintenance patterns. Uh, one that I, I think personally, I'm not just saying it will take off, but it has been suggested to me, uh, children who maybe have not have attained the examination grades that they thought they were going to get, or more personally, their parents think they have that they were going to get, uh, could we begin to see a, a raft of claims for uh, failure to uh, educate and so forth. I say that as somebody, I've got a, a daughter who's uh, a teacher, a daughter who's a, a student, and a, and a stepdaughter who's at school. I think the establishments are doing everything they possibly can within reason, but it'll be interesting to see uh, where, where this ends up. Uh, like I say, it, it's interesting to sort of ponder some really changes in the working environment. Uh, uh, they do bring with them some inherent risks, uh, many of which we may not have recognised, uh, some of which I think a lot of good work has been done to try and bring to the fore and manage. But it'll be interesting to see if we were doing this presentation in four or five years' time and we were put up some statistics, what, what they would look like. Uh, thanks, thanks, Christy. Uh, I know there's a lot of legal commentary going to follow, so I'm just going to touch upon uh, no presentation would be complete without just a, a warning from the health and safety. Just to, to remind everybody, as I say, employers, organisations, you are responsible for uh, the welfare of your employees, wherever they may be working from. Uh, thanks, thanks, Christy. Uh, I, I, I don't mind uh, saying that, uh, the term dark side I picked up from a presentation from a colleague uh, we're doing internally to us uh, around it. Uh, there are some dangers of working from home. I think these have been fairly well documented, you know, isolation from the, from the business. Uh, there can be a detachment from the corporate world, uh, uh, the, the organisation work for, work for. Will that dilute motivation? Will it dilute loyalty? Who, who will know? How do you deal with rogue and maverick behaviour styles? Uh, I often, often I've been accused of it, but I mean, people can begin to, to work outside of the norm and what the rules and the regulations are. Uh, they can become almost an independent operator. Uh, the danger of overworking, when do you, when do you turn off? It, as I say, I've been doing it for 16 years. It took me five years to begin to get some proper discipline about when to uh, turn the computer off and to stop sending emails. Uh, we, we refer to something there about the management fear, the trust gap. Uh, you could say, has, has, has management ever trusted employees and vice versa? But that the danger is that a gap can grow with agile working uh, and with less uh, visibility, as it were. Uh, distractions, uh, how do you concentrate? How do you deal with what, what, what's happening? Uh, I, I've got my wife and my youngest daughter in the house today. Uh, I've already, I already know that spaghetti is being cooked. Uh, I've heard a bit of music, which I had to get turned down uh, quickly before we started. It's just a rub of life, isn't it? Uh, it it's where we are today. Uh, uh, you know, so the suitability of the home environment, is it fit for, for purpose? Is it fit for, for meetings and so forth? Uh, thanks, uh, Christy. Well, uh, accelerated home working, the new daily recovery, Zoom, Teams. Uh, I had a slight panic at 20 to 10 because I couldn't get in the room, uh, which I suppose is equivalent of being held up on the tram or in traffic uh, trying to get to the meeting venue. But thankfully, uh, I, I could. We, we just feel like now that the world is our, it's limitless, isn't it? We can connect with anybody uh, anywhere in the world. We can talk with them. Uh, the, there's a sense of almost constantly being available. The, the, the daily avalanche of emails, I don't think people have got enough to do. Well, they have got enough to do. They just keep sending emails because they're not out in the office, not traveling. There's no break in their working day. So all of a sudden, I think we're all feeling this, this constant avalanche. Uh, uh, you, you, those that are working from home for the first time will certainly find out and become a, a technical expert on all things IT, how the Wi-Fi works and, and everything. Uh, I've already mentioned some uh, home conflicts. I think a real challenge is maintaining long-term motivation uh, and you know making Monday look different to Friday, Friday look different to Thursday. They said the same feeling of, of being enclosed in the four uh, vanilla walls uh, as, it, as it were. Okay, thanks, uh, Christy. So post-pandemic, I think what, what the sort of short term looks like is, although a lot of organisations are, are gearing up to return to the office, 
Uh, certainly our own organisation is now beginning to put in plans in, in place and I think we're at about 25% occupancy uh, where, where we can. Uh, obviously we've got the government continued message which is those that can work from home should work from home and, and those of us that do work from home and can work from home we will be the last to enter anything uh, rela relating to an office. Uh, uh, we're developing this sort of home office hybrid muscle, uh, model you, you know people a lot of people I spoke to said, well, I used to work from home one day a week uh, and four days in the office. I'm thinking of making that two days a week now from home and three days in the office. That That's fine. I don't think many employers are going to keep a desk open and available for three-fifths of a working week, uh, particularly in some of the city centres where the, the cost of having a desk can be quite expensive. So you can see in two or three years' time, uh, organisations reducing their office space and, and pushing more people out to working from uh, from home. Uh, I think we're just going to be careful that we, we don't rush the process. Uh, I, I've managed to get to, I think, this stage and not use the word COVID, although I have used the word pandemic. But, you know, our, our process is going to be uh, COVID and uh, HS compliant. It, it feels as though the vaccination programme is working. It feels as though we're coming through the worst of uh, what we've been through. But we still just need to be careful and make sure that uh, everything is, 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 is as it should be. Out, out of interest, uh, currently we've seen about 93 claims slash incidents uh, of those incidents relating to COVID. Probably uh, probably about 50% are actual bona fide claims that have come in. Uh, often they've been clusters of employees at the same location. For instance, we've had six police officers at one police station uh, all putting claims. Uh, I think, you know, it seems obvious to say, doesn't it, but our working style, uh, employees, uh, employers, we've got to remain dynamic and adaptable to change. The, the world has moved on and was moving on beforehand, but it's just been accelerated beyond probably all our, our comprehension. Uh, someone said to me that we've probably had 10 years of uh, change uh, crammed into one year, and I, and I think that's probably a fair a fair comment. Uh, thanks, uh, Christy, if we can turn over. Uh, longer term, I think it's key that, that the HR departments take a lead in delivering this along with the management teams. Uh, something I really would encourage everyone to bear in mind and consider. I don't believe lockdown has been a true test of organisations' abilities to manage agile work in long term. I think there's a sense of community spirit. We've all been in together. We all wanted to come through the pandemic. We all feared for our own futures. Would we have a job? Wouldn't we have a job? Some people have seen it as a short-term situation. Uh, and, and I think because we've come through it successfully, I think a lot of organisations, individuals feel that, you know, it's been a true test of what it's, what it's like. Uh, it, it isn't. Uh, I'll just give you one example. Uh, you're sat working from home, all your colleagues are in the office. You can hear the laughing and joking. You're in there on Zoom. Will you feel left out? When you come off that Zoom meeting, will you be able to go for a coffee with them? No, you won't. How, how will those things be managed at present? While everyone's in the same boat or the same situation, it works fine. Once those dynamics change, it will bring a different set of uh, uh, challenges. Uh, thanks, uh, Christy, if you can change. Uh, I, I, I don't intend talking through this slide, you'll be glad to know, but I just wanted to give you something there really, just about some of the key things, uh, again, which I think everyone's really on top of, uh, about a healthy uh, working home environment. Uh, for me, they, they are all equally as important, but I think the one that probably would stand out for me more than anything else is socialisation. That, that's probably me and the kind of person I am, but I do think we are meant to have contact with people. Uh, I really miss the meeting, the day-to-day -day interaction with people, uh, uh, discussing problems, tackling problems face-to-face -face and talking them through. Uh, so, you know, there's something there for you for, to ponder and see how that fits with your own organisations. Uh, uh, tackling of the situation. Thanks, uh, Christy. So this was a little bit of a, a takeaway maybe in terms of some uh, tips on risk assessment. As I say, this is a, a trilogy, uh, Lord of the Rings, uh, that we're going to be doing uh, three of these now before the end of the year. And certainly for, for the RMP bit, we intend to kind of provide you with, with some kind of a, as a takeaway within each one, uh, as it were. So uh, first one is a risk assessment we're looking at really in making sure the IT equipment, the suitable internet systems, remote access, it's all working. Uh, I think any policy, and if you've heard us speak on this topic before, we have suggested every organization should have a policy on home working and agile working. Like I say, it's not just about the home, it can be in a hotel, it can be at a conference, it can be anywhere. 
Uh, what are those working hours going to look like? It, it's fine saying to employees, basically just work to get the job done and make it manage yourself. Uh, I, I can speak from my personal experience, you, you know, that, that can be a challenge in actually curtailing the hours. And it is healthy uh, that, that people have somewhere if they are fortunate enough to have a room or somewhere in the house where they can close the door and step away from it. Uh, when I first started working from home, I had my files on the dining room table, my laptop, I, and I had to, you know, after three months, I just knew I couldn't carry on working like that. I had to find a, a different setup because it worked. Uh, consider the workstation suitability. Uh, these workstations now could be providing someone with a setup now for, for you know, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years. Uh, it's no longer someone sat in their bed uh, on an ironing board with a laptop for three months while the pandemic first kicked in, as indeed quite a number of people, certainly the younger end, uh, people who house shared, people who didn't have the benefit of a, of a, of a separate area in the house, maybe a desk. That was fine. Now we are entering the the real phase of agile working and we need to make sure that everything is uh, ergonomically assessed as best it can be and everything is working the way we'd like uh, I, I mentioned there is a work a risk to others uh, such as children i just think that's something you've got to bear in mind and a person i don't think it particularly is uh, uh, also bear in mind that some home workers may require certain adaptations uh, due to uh, any kind of uh, disability they may have. I mentioned their uh, data management, just possibly have a think about, you know, information that you potentially might print off and leave around the house. You could have other people coming into the house. Uh, 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 it could be workmen, it could be anybody. And just be aware maybe of where that information may be, how accessible it could be. When you finish with that information, do you shred it? Do you take it into work and shred it? Do you uh, do you just stick it in the bin and hope to God that it doesn't turn up on a, 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 a landfill site somewhere? Uh, thanks, uh, Christy. Uh, we've seen a number of, oh, sorry, Christy, if we could just go back one, please. Thank, thank you. Uh, we, we've seen uh, uh, homes often now become maybe a, a gathering place, a meeting place for people to, to get together with. I mean, uh, that that's something that uh, certainly you know people who know me and Adrian Blore in in, uh, in in Sheffield, we've often met each other's houses. Uh, in fact, Adrian did the pleasure once of cooking me uh, cheese on toast in the microwave, uh, an unusual experience, nothing to do with lockdown. It was just his lack of uh, culinary skills, but. Uh, I still wear the uh, I still wear the cheese on toast now on the bottom of my trainers. But uh, how suitable is it? You know, so these are things we've got to think about. You know, you take away meeting rooms, take away offices. You, you may provide people with meeting rooms and say, well, they're there. Can you book one? Can you get one? Can you get access to it? People say, no, why don't we just make cost of coffee? It's half away, it's easier. These are all things that are going to be part of this agile working environment. Uh, do we need to think about, you know, fire risks? It should be a provision of fire extinguishers. I, I don't know. Maybe we've got to speak to risk managers, health and safety, legal to, to look at it. Uh, uh, for those people who may have tools uh, or different materials, where are they stored? You, you know, are they going to be safe in a garage? If there's not a garage available, you know, you can't live in a playroom, can you? Or whatever your kids may be, or your dog, uh, you, you, you can have a poo, your cockapoo, whatever you call them. We used to call them mongrels when I was a kid. Uh, I mentioned like about security, uh, as it were. But what about first aid provision? Uh, where does that come into it? W uh, one of the things that we certainly found is that we had to adapt our sick uh, leave policy because what we found happening was that we could have people who would ring up and say, look, I feel awful. You know, there's no way I can, I can go to these meetings today. You know, and that was quite right. You know, who, who wants to, to, to sit, sit with somebody who's coughing all the way through a meeting? However, they would then sit and do emails all day. And we began to think, well, there's going to be a balance here. You know, if you're not able to do one part of the job, is it right that they, they should be able to continue with, with the other part of the job? And is it fair to them? Because it's so easy uh, when when you're sat at home to click on and do emails, no matter how awful you feel. If that was a working environment in the office and you came to the office and you said to your, your line manager, your boss, you felt under the weather, they could see you under the weather, they could hear you coughing. People might say, look, go home and get yourself right, you know, come back in a couple of days. And you'd go off and you'd have a break, get yourself ready, get yourself right, and then be back at work, fresh and ready to go. It's easy to uh, drag uh, a cold, flu, whatever it may be uh, uh, on, 
uh, by not looking after yourself, but simply because you sit there all day uh, carrying on with with, uh, with emails. Uh, a point now you just mentioned about new workers and you know expectant mothers. Uh, uh, you know where where do they fit within within the risk assessment? Uh, does it take uh, care of them, as it were? I think GB have also issued something just talking about uh, fire materials. They've just issued a bulletin about chairs and their suitability and their fire uh, resistance, uh, as it were. So there's a whole host of things which I think are just beginning to emerge as challenges and questions about agile working that we all need to be aware of, and it'll be absolutely fascinating. Uh, when some of these decisions start going through the courts and uh, one would hope they will adopt a sensible uh, position on it. Okay, thanks, Christy. Uh, just just finally, uh, I think all I would say is it just be prepared to, to, to be dynamic, to change, uh, not, not don't be frightened to say maybe we didn't get this quite right first time round. Uh, I, I think if, if you reviewed things in an office environment, you know, uh, every two years, every three years, I would encourage you under the agile uh, environment to do it annually until you feel you've got the balance right. You know that that you aren't suppressing people, that you aren't missing opportunities, and that you're getting the balance right around how it's being being managed. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, Christy. I've got one minute now, and I'm just going to recap. Uh, well, agile working was here before uh, the pandemic. Uh, it, it's certainly here now. It's it, it's great and it's ever been. It's certainly going to stay. Uh, I, I think many organisations, I think us as individuals, will learn to manage the risks as we go along. Uh, isn't ideal, but that that is where we're at with it. And I think we just got to be aware of it, uh, as it were. Uh, I think it's key that the risks, as much as they can be, are identified. They risk assessed. I think that I think of everybody in that environment, as it were. Uh, I would encourage any any organisation to document your decision making, particularly against the backdrop of government advice, government guidelines about where you are at any one particular point in time. It will be interesting to see when we start looking at some of these employers' liability claims that we're getting, where an organisation was on the curve of advice the government was given, were they following it, were they just behind it, were they ahead of it, and so forth. And I think uh, finally, let's be prepared to adapt quickly and uh, make changes as necessary. And, and let's see where the future takes us on all of this. Uh, I think what, what's sort of unusual a little bit about the pandemic is it affects us all in uh, our professional and our social and private lives. So we, we are in it together, uh, if that doesn't sound too much of a cliche. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, Christy. I think that should be done. Uh, I won't read out a disclaimer. We just have to put it on there. Siobhan, any any questions? Um, thanks, Phil. No, no questions have come through specifically um, at the moment. And um, bearing in mind the time, I think we'll just move on to the next one, if that's OK. But thank you very much, Phil, for that interesting thanks, thanks start. Thanks, everyone. And I'll, uh, I'll mute myself. Thank you. Words that many people want to hear. <laughs> OK, so the next session now, uh, looking at insurance and risk management post-COVID, uh, led by Aon and the ACT Group. So we've got Andrew Millard and Philip Morton from Aon, and we've got Mark Wielden from the ACT Group. So just a little introduction of the, uh, the three of them before I let them uh, take the screen. So Phil began his career in enforcement with local authorities, latterly working with enforcement liaison officers for the health and safety executive. With the HSC, um, his job included licensing and enforcement of public events, venues, and large crowd management, none of which have been happening over the last year, of course. Um, he sat on the county crowd safety advisory groups and administered the requirements of all health and safety related legislation across all sectors of industry and prosecuted individuals and companies under food safety, health uh, safety and licensing uh, legislation. He has a law degree and the LPC and took specialist electives in personal injury, employment law, advanced commercial litigation. Uh, outside of work, he's out on his mountain bike in the hills with his children, although he tells me that he does sometimes forget the kids but he's always got his colleagues permanently on his back for something, even out of work. That sign of the times, I think. Moving on to Andrew Millard. So Andy leads the public sector practice for Aon in the North, and he's got 18 years in the insurance industry. He tells me that his wife and kids are now too scared about what he'd look like without a beard, so he's been told to keep it. That's his excuse. Um, and finally, Mark uh, Wielden, having worked in the field of health and safety uh, and health and environment compliance for over 24 years, Mark has been involved in the development of both national and international standards 
with regard to compliance in the workplace for some of the world's largest commercial entities. And as well as that, he's been managing a team of highly qualified health and safety risk management consultants across a variety of risk profiles. Away from work, Mark says that he is an avid rugby fan, mainly a supporter these days because he tells me that games can take a week for him to get over. I share that pain. Um, not on rugby, I have to say, but my own sporting. And one day he hopes to take off number one on his bucket list by taking to the field with his two sons. I hope that happens. OK, over to you, gentlemen. Right. Well, thank you very much, Siobhan, and thank you for everyone for join, joining this morning. So the um, presentation we're about to have now for 30 minutes or so, it's going to complement what, what Phil's been talking about, Phil, Phil Farrow, that is. And, uh, well, it's just unfortunate that my introduction is not as exciting as everyone else's. But in terms of COVID risk management, so over the last 12 months, we've received a lot of queries from all sorts of organisations about risk management and the implications for them. And the key implication is a change in the policies and procedures in place. And it's on that that Phil and Mark are going to talk through now the, the experiences they've had with all sorts of industries and organisations and the various good and bad practices that they've seen. And uh, perhaps there's some good takeaways for those attending. So Phil, Mark, over to you. Thank you, Andy. Um, good morning, everybody. Because um, this is 16 years at Aon for me. And um, what I think I've found out in the last year is the solution to many of my troubles, which is working alongside Phil Farrow for many of those 16 years, I found a way to keep him on time for the first time ever. Um, what I've got to do is go through probably five or six slides here, and then I'll hand over to Mark, who we work very, very closely with. Um, we're going to try to expand on some areas which I think will be relevant. We're going to try very hard not to come across uh, too salesy but by default some of the anecdotes we'll be giving you about um, will be about work we have been doing with with clients in your sectors and other clients um, please ask questions we're quite happy at the end to answer them doesn't matter how technical or tricky they are if I'm brutally honest they're the highlights of uh, video calling for us when we get caught on the hoof a little bit it makes us work very very hard Christy can you jump on the slide please so here we go um, the bold items here are really the ones which we think are most pertinent for um, the participants today. We've got, as you would imagine, a, on a comprehensive portfolio of clients and, and sectors that we work in. And across that, we have many specialist teams and people. But there's some common themes running throughout um, what we think the post-pandemic workplace will look like. But just to really help you guys who are listening in focus these are some of our specialities um, where we've got plenty to add um, and plenty of support that we can offer. For us, what we're going to try and do today is, is help you understand what we think and what we're seeing and what we're hearing. Um, and that will naturally lead on to um, Mark giving some real specific solution lines that we think you will have in place and should be considering to help navigate the, the many of the issues that Phil Farrah has just been talking about. Um, Christy, jump on a slide, please, if you would. So some basics. Apologies for sounding just a little bit too legal about this, but the law hasn't changed. Um, I'm going to say the C word. It's written down there, so I'm allowed to. Um, COVID-19. You know, I, we don't want to oversimplify this. It has been quite a significant event in many, many people's lives. There's opportunity off the back of that but there's also some pretty drastic situations that have been unfolding. What we do know when it comes to the regulatory perspective is it is a workplace hazard. It is another hazard to add to the other significant hazards within your workplace. And Phil Farrah touched um, very effectively around uh, risk assessment on what ought to be happening, what could be happening, what may happen going forward and the resilience of those risk assessments is something that we're not going to let slip over the next 20 odd minutes but it is a workplace hazard and therefore your organization needs to decide if it is a significant finding in your workplace quite how over the last year if your workplace has been open covid isn't a significant finding and warranting some documentation what we'd love to know 
But it, it comes back to the three P's for us, which is setting a policy, having procedures and backing it up with paperwork. Risk profiles of organisations have changed dramatically. And I'm going to cross over with where Phil has just been talking. Um, but th this is really from our perspective. We know home working has dramatically increased. We know travelling to work for many organisations and employees has, has, has stopped. But for many on this call today, it, it hasn't. We know risk assessments and control measures are, uh, are tricky, but there is some great govern, government guidance out there. Um, and we're now in a situation where organisations that have worked throughout the last year are now being joined by organisations reopening their premises and they're now addressing how they manage through policy, procedure and paperwork the risk profile of their organisation as we head into, I don't know who coined the phrase, but you know, the new better, I think, was the optimistic phrase that was being um, thrown around. Phil was fairly pessimist pessimistic. It's, 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 he's not known for his pessimism, isn't Phil? But um, I, I think there's optimism in there from a lot of other organizations there's huge opportunity for organizations to shift their working practices and i think one of the things that i i would do there's a recent article in the times around office work uh, and and the changes that have gone on with it over decades probably the last century we know that by common consent in 1906 the Larkin building in New York was constructed and it was deemed the first modern office complex. It was modeled by the architects on a, on a, a manufacturing environment. It got huge open plan floors for all the workers to sit in, post rooms, typing pools, management teams. And it was very much modeled on what people were used to seeing, which is large open plan manufacturing environments. I could argue that in my part of the world, Siobhan, um, up here in Yorkshire, um, Titus Salt might have got a lead on this by a good 50 or 60 years or so but nonetheless um, the Americans claim to have nailed it in New York in 1906 it took approximately 60 to 70 years before there was a shift in that working environment and in the 1970s and into the 1980s workers wanted to have cubicles to work with and get some private space and create what we would call the goldfish environment where, and many of us will know this from our career paths, there was a time where if you could get into a, your own office or your own cubicle, it was deemed an elevated status off the common working areas, out of the open plan office, into your own goldfish bowl or a corner view uh, office, and you knew you were really doing well in your career. I joined Aon 16 years ago um, from the public sector, um, and didn't have a desk given to me. I was expected to be in a few of the offices for the first six months of my life to understand Aon, but I've never had a desk. I've been uh, designated as a, a home worker for those 16 years. Um, Aon opened its head office in London a few years ago. Um, and as Phil alluded to earlier, um, everybody who heads into that office is classed as an agile worker. Um, it's not unusual for the commercial sector to try and lead on these things. The public sector will make its own mind up as to whether it can follow the commercial world. But agile working within Aon has, has been around probably for a couple of decades. Um, we're expected to be out and about. You can go to an office and you can try finding a desk. But at the end of the day, you have to clear your desk. It's not yours for tomorrow. There are very, very few goldfish bowls available within Aon globally. And we have this... We have this situation now where, as Phil said, uh, over one year, everything seems to have accelerated at the rate of a 10-year time frame. There are now organisations rapidly looking at their commercial office uh, spend. There are organisations that have realised you can have workforces work from home and be as productive. There is this huge pressure within commercial organisations to look at agile working by way of being able to cut cost out of the business model and of course that opens up the risk assessment challenge it opens up the business process challenge and there is no silver bullet that can make that happen for any organization there is behind all of this the uk legislative framework that protects employees and it's very very clear and it's very very well drafted 
and there is plenty of guidance on it and plenty of support out there for people to to re, uh, rely on but we're now in a situation where um organizations are moving to agile working and employees want agile working but it isn't about getting rid of office space in its entire entirety now this is a hybrid opportunity where most of us who've been stuck at home for a, a year are craving office time again craving visits to see organizations like the ones you work at we we've had enough of the vanilla walls and the cheese on toast out of the microwave and stroke in the mongrel that's at my feet right now um we we want to get back into the real world what we've got to realize is there's some middle ground to be found it isn't all or nothing the change we're seeing now in in the roaring 20s as it will become known i am sure will be around that flexibility the fact that internationally we have had colleagues who've gone to second homes or their family homes abroad and still remain right in the center of our delivery to our clients even though they're operating from madrid or singapore or in some cases australia albeit that's the mongrel i apologize um, we call her a cockapoo, but apparently that's not de rigueur at the moment. There are opportunities here, despite the shift in, in, in time zones, for, for people to give their best. And if, if it wasn't the dog that was barking, it would be the little two-year-old that I've been fending off. Um, you know, we can do this now. We have become accustomed to the fact that you don't get the clinical perfection that we used to have 18 months ago on presentations like this. But what I've noticed along with everybody else is camera time is more important than just a simple phone call. A year ago, it was very difficult to get people on a video call. Nobody really liked it. Everybody was worried about how the beard looked. Everybody's worried about how the hair looked and whether you should wear a tie or not. Now, nobody's really judging us for that. They're judging us on the content and whether we can do the work quickly and efficiently. And that's what matters. Are you getting the results? How are you measuring those results? And are the basic legislative requirements being complied with? Christy, can you jump on a slide? It's all about leadership. It's all about policy, procedure, and paperwork. There will be very difficult times ahead for some organizations who cannot reasonably explain why there is no policy for some of this very tricky agile working arrangement whether you need fire extinguishers providing to your staff domestically or not it's going to be a huge debate around things like that do you need to put the portable appliance testing machine in the post and send it to someone and just plug in the laptop and the screen that you've sent them what about the red hot multi-adapter just under the table with another six devices plugged into it and the lamp there are going to be some significant issues and, and undoubtedly claims will follow that but we're in the UK, we've got the guidance and we've got a network of opportunity that can get ahead of that. The, um, the risk management approach, a complete risk management approach is what's needed. And you're going to need some expertise and competency to do that. If you can jump on a slide, Christy. So there's a few things here, a bit of jargon, apologies all round, a LARP calculations. I, th I threw that one in because um, it's Pandora's box, if you like, looking at a LARP calculations. What is an a LARP calculation? As low as reasonably practicable. Many people will be familiar with the term. Stems from the Health and Safety at Work Act um, in terms of doing enough, taking money into consideration, time, effort, the risk versus reward versus what's reasonable. But an LARP calculation stems also from the chemical manufacturing industry, whereby if you built a big chemical plant in the 1960s and 70s, you had to come up with a number, a financial and monetary number undertaken in a LARP calculation. And it was a term, determinative factor of a number of different elements. The algorithm behind it was cost of build, how much uh, the, the product uh, is going to be generated, how long the factory is going to exist for. And out of those calculations, you, you would have to come up with a number which gave you a target spend for your health and safety management system. And one of my favorite questions back in, in the dark old days of enforcement um, was getting the, the barrister to ask a question of a chief executive or a managing director under cross-examination and asking how much 
their organization spends on health and safety management? It's a killer question. It's a very simple question, but it catches people off guard very, very easily because most people will be able to recall some figure to do with the health and safety budget. But it's often uh, a couple of zeros out on the real spend. The answer they give more often than not was woefully low. And of course, there is no right answer. But an ALAP calculation can start helping organisations un understand what the total cost of spend on safety management is. And as they move through the rapid changing work environments that are happening now, you must look at what reasonable is. How do you prove it? You've got to have some good people who understand this process and you've got to have some ability to run the spreadsheets and the data. Um, Phil alluded to the makeshift uh, workstations. I've moved from my um, highly compliant desk environment into, into this environment. It's slightly more photogenic and the chairs do match the wallpaper, but it's just for a couple of hours, perfectly legitimate. We've got um, some specialist musculoskeletal um, experts working within Aon who uh, operate out of the US, they work globally and have been doing it virtually for a number of years. And they have produced some amazing documents that we can send through for free about some of the tricks that work. Um, the first bullet point, I remember it every single time because I still enjoy reading it, um, it's, it's for employers to hand back to employees. And it says that time that you would normally spend commuting to the office during your agile days working remotely, whether it be at a, a Costa or, or uh, your parents' house or your own house or somewhere else, um, use that to sleep. We don't get enough sleep. We never get enough sleep. And those of us who have been working from home for 12 months or so um, will know that the computer will go on as early as you reasonably can get away with it and stay on as late as you can. Employers, the vast majority of employers benefit from people overworking, but it's not great for the employees and it will take its toll and it will cumulatively lead to more of the stress at work claims or the improper working um, uh, workstation claims that we, we will see come in. Um, third bullet point, uh, a thousand people would, were uh, interviewed, 8% um, of riddles involve an ironing board injury in the last year. Um, these are riddles, reporting of injury, disease and danger occurrence regulations. These are work-related ironing board injuries. And I don't think there's that many ironing companies out there doing domestic ironing for people that it would spike like that. I think we can all imagine how these ironing boards have potentially come to hurt people whilst at work. But as an employer, if you haven't tried to control this in some way, and as Phil said, you know, Phil, Phil worked today on uh, alongside us uh, uh, many, many moons ago. Um, it, it, if you're not getting checked by your employer every year, every couple of years, or having some self um, certification to fill in, you're going to get instances like ironing boards collapsing on people. Um, government de uh, derogation, we've had a year of a temporary derogation from having to go into people's houses, um, either virtually or in real life, to undertake the risk assessments that the regulations would require. How long is a temporary derogation? How long dare you get away with it? How permanent do you think, if you can look forward, your agile working status for your employees will be? You need to start making some decisions to, as to whether to act before the government say, right, the derogation is coming to an end. Next slide, please, Christy. Um, Harland and Wolf, Carey and Vauxhall, I'm not going to dive into these case, this case law. This is merely there to, to highlight the secondary uh, nature of claims sometimes. These uh, these in the headlines here stem from asbestos related claims where mesothelioma has been picked up typically by the partner of someone who worked either at Harland and Wolf, the shipbuilders or Vauxhall. This is, these are the overalls being washed by usually the spouses shaken, uh, asbestos fibers being breathed in and uh, asbestos related diseases being contracted by people who didn't work at those uh, factories. So when it comes to the C word, COVID, in the workplace, Phil's alluded to a number of claims he's well aware of. We, uh, certainly from our claims management executive's perspective, uh, are getting a lot of questions asked around 
what happens if it goes beyond just the workers into more vulnerable people who are perhaps at home? If there's a cluster at work and it's pretty easy to show that work haven't been trying to comply with the, the, the rules and, and the guidance that's out there from Her Majesty's government, it would naturally follow that an elderly parent who picked it up from a, a son or daughter or in-laws who came home from a cluster at work and cross-contaminated, it, it would naturally follow that there could be quite some significant action following that. Of course, behind all of that is medical causation, and I'm not here to go into that one today. Um, for me, it's policy, procedure, and paperwork. How have you established your risk assessments? That's the capitalized R and A, and what documentation records exist to help prove what you've been doing? And are they in any way, shape or form capable of being um, retrieved and brought into a, a, an investigative bundle, an accident investigation, an incident or a disease investigation, or as Siobhan and me and a few others may call it, a, a defence bundle, because they become disclosable documents that we're going to be seeking you help us generate should claims start to arise. I'm going to... Um, Ask Mark to come off mute, if you would, and I'll let you go from here, if that's okay, Mark. Yeah, sure. Like, thanks, Phil. Uh, Chris, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, thanks, Phil. Um, one of the things we also wanted to do with this is we're very aware that when uh, people attend these uh, virtual sessions, or indeed if we're in an auditorium, that there's going to be a lot of words used by people like us. Oh, boy, you need to think of this, and you, you ought to look at this, and we have a rise and scan that this might happen. Uh, what we also wanted to do today is just give you some examples of what is happening, uh, some of the programmes that we're involved in, some of the lessons that we've learned both from within uh, local authority, within public sector, uh, and indeed from more industrial commercial settings where there are some transferable learnings which I think uh, are quite rightly uh, uh, should be utilised. I think what is very clear of the message so far is that COVID is but one has a profile. Yes, it's an enormous one. Yes, it will be spoke about for many, many, many years to come. But it isn't the only one. And one of the things that uh, the team that I work with within Aon, uh, which contains some real sector specialisms and also some very uh, high profile risk specialisms, is that one of the potential failings that is becoming apparent is the siloed approach in which COVID is being managed. Um, what, what, what I mean by that is we've heard of words from Phil, like the three Ps. Uh, we, we've heard about uh, guidance publications that are out there. Uh, and, and the guidance, I would echo your sentiments, Phil, is very good. Uh, in, in fact, what, one of the big uh, tips I would also add to uh, Phil Farrar's uh, first uh, section about risk assessment is align your risk assessment to the HMG guidance. Um, the guidance gets updated on a regular basis. If your section of your risk assessments are aligned to that, updating uh, that becomes so much easier. Uh, and certainly if you were to have either COVID inspection or you want to use your risk assessment for training, uh, then it really eases that situation. But one of the things that we've seen is that there is such attention being applied to COVID that other aspects of risk management are perhaps being bypassed. Um, and, and for us, when you look at the, so far as is reasonably practicable uh, uh, concept, we have to consider what COVID is. It, it is one microbiological hazard in a world of hundreds and hundreds of hazards in the workplace. Now, all I wanted to do is give you some examples of uh, some projects we're involved in where this has come to the fore uh, and something that we've had to investigate a little bit further. Uh, I am going to start with a bit of a shocking uh, uh, story, to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, Christy, if we can move on to the next slide, please. Um, what, one of the clients that we've engaged with um, over the last sort of eight, eight, six to eight months is a very large uh, multi-academy trust. Uh, education, um, I think, came in. Um, Phil, I'll, I'll echo some of your sentiments. My wife's a teacher as well. Uh, and I think, you know, some of the stress that the education fraternity has been put under is immense. Um, contrary to popular belief, not all teachers have had the last year off. Uh, they've worked in some incredibly testing conditions, 
Uh, and for those that, uh, that are aware of what goes on within the education sector, we realise it's not all about education. Uh, there is massive amounts of child welfare uh, for which uh, you know, children rely on the school for. However, when you start looking at the school environment, and uh, there's a particular Multi Academy of Trust that we've been working with, um, when we first got involved with them and they asked us to have a look at what they were doing around COVID, it was very specifically, we want you to look at our plans around COVID. Um, their COVID risk assessment was actually all right. Uh, and that's not a particularly technical word, but it was okay. It wasn't the best we've ever seen. It's not the worst we've ever seen. But it broadly followed the government guidance that was available at the time. However, right in the middle of that risk assessment, there was a startling line that said, of course, all fire doors will now need to be wedged open. Uh, and when I say wedged, I don't mean on mag locks, I don't mean by foot control release, I mean literally old fashioned wedge. Now, when we sort of engaged with that Multi Academy Trust and said, okay, got to ask, why are you doing this? And it is apparent across your sites this is happening because we've been to them. What, what, what was your driver? And of course it was, well, we, don't, we want to avoid the uh, multi-contact points. I think it's a great example, though, of where we have substituted the risk control mitigation of one particular hazard and absolutely obliterated the existing risk controls of a very, very serious hazard in the workplace. Now, right at the start of the pandemic, fire authorities had been really, really clear in their communications of please do not allow your COVID-19 controls to undermine your fire controls. And they literally cited that uh, they would see the wedging open of fire doors in an inappropriate manner as an enforceable action. I think it's, uh, it's not that this particular multi county trust were, were, were daft, it wasn't that they were a bunch of charlatans and really weren't thinking about uh, uh, teacher and child welfare. It was just an example of a knee-jerk reaction because it's so much on the public's uh, consciousness where risk management in its entirety seems to have gone out the window. And it's an example of where a siloed approach can in fact be almost quite dangerous. Uh, Phil, I'm just going to pick up on a point uh, you mentioned earlier on, Phil Farrar as well. You mentioned about the stress being placed upon teachers. Um, what, one of the other things which we're having to work with now is you are quite right. Uh, a lot of teachers are now going to have to mark exams for the first time and give scores out. Uh, and, and as you said earlier on, uh, of course, you know, li little Jimmy's parents are obviously expecting the highest score because Jimmy is perfect in, in their little eyes. Another part of risk management now has to consider what about security and potential uh, threat uh, of, of violence to teachers where they uh, are giving students scores which they weren't expecting. Now, that's not a COVID-19 uh, uh, hazard uh, issue, but it is a knock-on effect of the pandemic that when you start looking at risk management um, from a covering perspective, they are issues that also need to be picked up. Uh, another example um, where, where we're working with a, a local authority is the idea of events. Uh, Siobhan, you, you mentioned uh, events, this thing of the distant past. Uh, we, we have an event safety division. Um, I think it's pretty clear in the public consciousness that people are clambering to take events on. People are clambering to want to go back out and get some part of normality. Uh, again, Phil, you mentioned earlier in, in your presentation, the human species, we like contact with one another. Uh, we, we want to be, we are social animals at the heart of what we are. But when you start looking at it from a local authority perspective and the idea of applying governance to events in a post-pandemic environment, that post-governance has changed. So yes, local authorities need to consider COVID-19 uh, aspects of events. Um, government through DCMS, uh, who we're working with on a couple of trial events, certainly have that into place. But one local authority we are currently working with, who have a number of potential events coming in the summer, have asked us to have a look at their COVID-19 controls, but through consultation with us, have suddenly realized that that also affects their counter-terrorism control 
It also affects their event safety management control, and it has the knock-on effects of their, cal their, their capacity calculations. Now, this particular local authority are dealing with this very early on and are getting these into, uh, into place. One of the concerns in and around the events world is, are people thinking about this early enough? Or is this something that's going to come a slightly late where we suddenly realise that all the events are happening at the same time, there isn't enough stewarding to go around, um, and local authorities are going to be overwhelmed by multiple events happening within their um, remit of uh, jurisdiction. Um, the very final example I'll give you is, uh, again, it's a, a public sector orientated uh, organisation who are starting to look at going back into work. And, and they're a bit of a mixed match in terms of part of that organisation has been in the workplace and part of it is coming back in. Now, part of what they do is they have uh, transport uh, management responsibilities uh, to a point where they also repair, maintain, service, fix uh, a fleet of vehicles uh, uh, under their uh, commercial undertaking. Now, Again, they asked us to have a look at their COVID-19 control. Uh, they asked us to have a look at their phase return back to work. And they thought about the idea of an influx of people suddenly coming in and what that might happen to you know, current uh, um, COVID controls. What was really apparent though in their thought process to date is that the building they were going to go back into had been left dormant for the best part of 12 months. Now, all of a sudden, we speak about COVID-19 as being a microbiological hazard. Well, so is Legionella. And nothing had happened within that building for the last 12 months about Legionella management. Um, they had a number of lifts uh, within that environment, both passenger lifts and uh, vehicle lifts and lifts on, on the rear of tailgates of some of their vehicles. Well, in that scenario, the six months and 12 months statutory inspection under Lola is required. Uh, and again, because of the pandemic, that hadn't been carried out. Uh, they also had a number of extraction uh, uh, systems in there. Again, under the COSH regulations, the 14 monthly statutory inspection is required. Again, something that hadn't been carried out. Now, again, this particular organisation engaged nice and early and had managed to put those things into place. But it's once again where this absolute viewpoint on COVID in a siloed nature, had that not been widened to the larger um, risk uh, management process, then some really serious issues could have been overlooked. Uh, Chris, if you can move on to the next slide, please. So I think the, the message from us, and I think we'll bring uh, Andrew Millard in, if I may, at this point, is that yes, there are lots of services that can be provided. Lots of what we do is COVID related. Uh, and that even goes into things that we do about training and, and, and the mechanisms in which we deliver training. Even our training programs, uh, we deliver virtually these days and have COVID aspects into them. But I think that the real takeaway, if anything, from us is that, yes, COVID is super serious, but it cannot be at the expense of everything else that needs managing in the workplace. Uh, and Andrew, I think you have perhaps a, a few things to say on, on that and uh, indeed some solutions we have to that. Yeah, thank you very much, Mark. So really, um, just really conscious of time here. I think, I think we've gone and uh, stepped out of the line a little bit. So on the final slide there, uh, Krista, um, obviously, again, going back to the whole remote agile working piece, delivering risk, ma risk management training is a challenge for all organisations. So really, on, on the final slide, as it uh, move, moves on, I know many of you because I know speaking to you and hearing the good stuff that you're doing you are moving more to e-learning and many organizations were anyway so really it's about um, looking at at this um, so almost re replacing your toolbox talks that you would have had around the office space that we've not really been able to have for the last year just consider that there are e-learning um, modules out there of, of all sorts that are available and it's just a matter of asking and engaging and uh, those can be introduced. Um, so, so that's it for me. I, I know many of you will have questions. So I had some which I'll leave now because of time and move on to Forbes. So Mark, Phil, thank you very much. 
thank you, thank you, gentlemen. And uh, just before we um, we do move on, I think Phil Farrer had a question that he wanted to put to the other Phil. So, yeah. Phil, can I just leave you to just ask that? You need to unmute yourself. Uh, thanks, uh, Siobhan. Yeah, uh, Phil, it's just a, a, an interesting point, really, uh, and I, I thought the presentation was excellent. Do you think? And, and it's more of a personal question. Do you think that video conferencing in the last 12 months and so has worked well? Because basically, we know each other by and large, and those relationships have been fostered through face to face meetings, often at conferences or in, in, in client meetings and so forth. And, and I think that's worked well. Do you think the same dynamic would work in five years' time if you had six people sat around a Zoom call who'd only ever met each other over email and they were trying to deal with a really difficult problem? and get some kind of sensible solution. It, yeah. I, the reason why I ask is my personal view is, I, I don't know how it will work. I think I think it works well now because we know each other. I don't know if it will work as well in the future. Yeah, I, I, I don't disagree with you, what, what, what you're saying there at all, Phil. I think that it goes back to my point around early 1900s, it was about open plan offices. By the 1970s, it was about to, squirreling everybody away into cubicles or into, into little office spaces. Um, in the last decade or two, it's become more open plan because that's collaborative working. It, it helps people socialise. We've become a lot more relaxed in open plan offices. Um, and then you can go to a goldfish bowl and, and get the privacy you need to be on some calls. With, with where we're heading now, it's a hybrid. It isn't all or nothing. And I think, Phil, you're absolutely right. If we are not physically out and about meeting people, these relationships and these chats and you know the, the, what you and I think they're funny nobody else does but the asides and the quips because you know we enjoy his jobs and we get on it, it helps us help people it will be different I have absolutely no doubt but what I have seen this year in my experience dealing with clients who I have never met we've done the work that we were going to do in person virtually and it's taken a little bit longer it's been incredibly difficult to deliver training um, organizations say you know understandably say can it get can we get a discount if it's done virtually you don't have any cost um yeah yeah you can you know how much of the presentation do you want us to shave off it, it, it it's this it's just it's even harder um and, and this goes to your point phil if there's 20 30 40 100 people in a room um and you're going through 60 or 70 presentation slides for a day or two the interaction has gone you've lost the personal touch you can't see who's fallen asleep you know who's put a picture up and disappeared um it's a hybrid and we're going to have to work really hard and employers are going to have to adapt to this and help coach and train employees force them to interact but do it properly but also force them to understand the, the downsides and upsides of, of, of agile working and locking people away for five days a week and never seeing anybody that they physically work with will work for a very small number of people but it will definitely change what businesses and organizations look like going forward if they don't get ahead of that curve yeah no, thanks for that's great Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I personally will be really upset if we um, are not able to get out and about again. It's one aspect of the job that I've done for nearly 30 years now that I've really, really enjoyed uh, in particular. OK, so just conscious of time, so I think we'll move on to um, the final um, session. We'll pick up any other questions um, at the end if there is a bit of time. Uh, so Tim Smith is uh, going to speak next. He is a Forbes Rising star, a senior associate at Forbes. He's going to be providing hopefully some practical guidance for dealing with accidents and, and claims that um, arise as a result of these changes that we've, we've seen and we've been talking about this morning. Tim joined Forbes as, in 2009 as a solicitor. He specialises in defending personal injury and property claims against local authorities and other, many other organisations. He has a particular interest on environmental claims, but also very much involved on employers' liability claims but he's really interested in tree root substance claims and Japanese knotweed claims. That's where he gets his, uh, his kicks. Um, out of work, he does enjoy tree hugging, uh, he tells me, and you may have seen his previous sessions on, uh, on trees claim. And uh, his particular hobby is barefoot running across boggy moorlands, rather him than me. He tells me that at home he spends time cooking and cleaning with his family, although we've never seen any evidence of cooking or cleaning at work but uh, that's what he says he does so over to you Tim for what I'm sure is going to be a very interesting session. Thank you very much Siobhan 
Um, yeah, the, the aim of this next session is to uh, give you some pointers and some ideas that you might want to take away in terms of dealing with accidents and potentially claims arising from uh, home working or telecommuting or uh, hybrid working. Um, so next slide, please, Christy. So in terms of content, what we're looking to run through is likely types of accidents or claims. Just bear in mind quack, so you may well get claimants putting together novel claims, different circumstances, um, because of no risk on, uh, on costs. Your legal responsibilities as the employer for employees working remotely. And we've broken that down into three separate sections. So we've got the home as a workplace, work practice and work colleagues. And then moving on from there, how to defend home working claims or some pointers as how to defend home working claims. Evidence, so a few of discussion on evidence and types of evidence. And then moving on to contributory negligence on the part of the employee or the claimant. A quick note on causation and then a summary. So next slide, please, Christy. So in terms of likely types of um, claims, I know we've already picked on those on, on previous um, slides and there have been numerous examples. Um, the kind of thing we think is, is going to be very similar. So the home is a workplace. We're going to have things like slips and trips. Um, possibly due to flooring or trailing wires, that kind of thing. Manual handling, we're looking at things like moving or adjusting work equipment, and possibly even assembly of homework equipment or when new homework equipment comes or is delivered. Work practice, so we look at the workstation itself, set up the uh, display screen uh, regulations relating to display screen equipment. RSI types of injuries, I think Phil mentioned previously about shoulder injuries, that kind of thing. Yeah, it's certainly all out there and I suspect we'll see it over the next um, few years. And then the big key that we think is going to happen, I think it's exactly what Phil mentioned, was psychiatric injury. So certainly I suspect the next few years we'll be seeing an increase in terms of um, stress at work cases, depression, low work in that kind of thing. And then the other point to remember, there's a bit of crossover here with um, employment. But in terms of work colleagues, just consider bullying and harassment or potential claims for bullying and harassment. Next slide, please, Christy. OK, so I've just put up some slides in terms of um, your experience of uh, home working or hybrid work working. Hopefully it's been relatively positive, such as this chap um, here. Um, but in reality, I suspect it's been a little bit more like this with various pulls on you in terms of home life, pets, and even the uh, workstation. Uh, next slide, please, Christy. Or you may have taken a slightly more relaxed approach, but again, as you, as you mentioned before, um, there are issues potentially about uh, where you're working and how you're working in terms of potential accidents and injuries. And the final next slide, please, Christy. Hopefully this hasn't happened to any of you or any of your colleagues, um, but this is what we're trying to prevent and ultimately deal with if we have to. So next slide, please, Christy. So the home is a workplace, the legal responsibilities, just like any other workplace, apart from you as the employer, I like to have a lot less control about the, the work premises, the, the home environment. But the basic principle remains the same. So the employer, you as the employer have the common law and statutory duty to ensure the safety of your employees and the duty is to take reasonable care. And this standard requires the employer to assess the potential risk of injury as against the harm the injury would cause and the cost of putting safety precautions in place. So as you mentioned before, it's pretty much a balancing exercise between the risk and the cost of doing something. Just to remind you, so the six pack regulations, they're still out there, they're still in, are still in force, even after the Enterprise Act, um, certainly in support of a claimant's case or claim, try and show negligence, and they're just as applicable to uh, home working or hybrid working as it might be to working in the, um, the, the usual office or, or workplace. Next slide, please, Christy. So legal responsibilities, um, there's not a lot new here. So you as the employer, you're required to provide a safe place of work, safe equipment, safe system of work and competent employees. A particular point I picked up from the earlier slides, yeah, you like to have meetings at other people's homes or other people's premises, and that in turn could lead to um, vicarious liability or responsibility on your part as the uh, employer. The starting point always has been pretty much for employment type cases. Um, risk assessment, really, really important risk assessment in terms of trying to defend cases and having good defensibility rates in terms of EL cases. So I've just flagged up again there, regulation three and also case law. So risk assessment is an essential starting point for employee safety. So can't really overemphasize uh, over that. Next slide, please, Christine. 
Slips and trips at home. Um, typically, we identify slips and trips, loose cables, spillages on the floor, that kind of thing. Um, ordinarily, if the employee were working in your office premises, then you'd have much, much more control over what's happening. Um, but with the employee working from home, it's very unlikely you'll have a great deal of control. So you're going to be pretty much reliant on the employee when it comes to ensuring their safety. Next slide, please, Christy. So with a uh, employer relying upon a home-based risk assessment, it's much greater emphasis on the, uh, on the employee or the claimant. Um, employees themselves do owe a duty to take reasonable care and comply with the employee's instructions and training. Um, but that said, um, there's basically three points to take away in terms of where we think this will go. We think that courts and trial judges, if cases get that far, will ultimately have a great deal of scrutiny in terms of what you did as the employer, based predominantly probably on the risk assessment, training records um, and refresher training. So we, we talked previously about um, training. Um, I think that's become even more to the fore and probably can looked up in far more detail by trial judges if cases get to um, court. There have been previous cases in relation to um, remote working. So it's not entirely new. This case of Cook and Square was actually about a um, employee working abroad. Um, the claimant employee wasn't um, successful. The claim was successfully defended but it was all to do with the employer's knowledge of the employee's workplace. Now, ordinarily, that may not be a great deal, but just to bear in mind, moving forward with things such as team and Zoom calls, you may end up as an employer having a, a greater knowledge or a greater view of your employee's workstation or their working environment. So just something to bear in mind that might be used against you um, at a future date when a claim uh, is presented. Next slide, please, Christy. So manual handling, um, just the same as before, the manual handling regulation is still applicable. The home would be a place of work. So again, consider risk assessments, control measures um, and training, and also a clear assessment or instructions on responsibility for who's gonna do what. So you mentioned um, previous, on previous slides, things like safety checks. So does the employee know who's gonna carry these out and when? Reporting of faults and breakages, maintaining work equipment, um, even assembly of home work equipment, are they able to do that? Um, has that activity been risk assessed? So it really comes back to the risk assessment and, um, and training. Next slide, please, Kristen. Workstation, um, I think we've mentioned this before, but consider the setup of the workstation. So what do you as the employer know about the employee's workstation at home and its suitability? Um, Phil mentioned again about his shoulder. So again, consider potentially back injuries, that kind of thing. RSI types of injuries, the twisting and turning at the, um, the workstation. Um, there's really helpful guidance from the HSC website about the, uh, dis the display screen regulations um, and display screen equipment. And they've effectively said, which I think we mentioned on the previous slide, no need to reassess is only temporary, um, but if permanent, may require reassessment. So if your, if your homework, if it's become a, a permanent arrangement in terms of home working or hybrid working, then consider whether or not you need to be reassessing. And also training on home working activity to make sure your employees are fully aware of what they need to be uh, doing. Next slide, please, Christy. So psychiatric injury, this is probably the biggest area we think or will be the biggest area, but I suspect we won't be seeing any significant claims for perhaps a, um, a couple of years. Um, it really comes about because of this whole thing about work-life balance and whether two can be separated. There's greater awareness generally with the, um, with the public in terms of social media and government advertising. Um, but the points that we see are certainly for consideration at this stage, there's an increased risk of mental illness due to fear of loss of income or job, but probably the two most important factors are the change. There's a new method of working, i.e. working from home, and new systems of communicating. So it's no longer face-to-face, -face, it's remote by the telephone or video conferencing. Um, so it's important to be aware that your employees are aware of how to use these systems. They're okay with using them. Um, and if, if required, you provide the appropriate um, training. Furlough, so there's a possibility of additional work on remaining employees. Uh, just bear that in mind in terms of potential um, psychiatric injury or concerns and depression and lone working anxiety. Hopefully, if you've got a good network in place in terms of uh, communication and telephone calls and video conferencing, that shouldn't become an issue. Um, but there is always a risk of uh, colleagues becoming isolated, particularly we think 
um, as mentioned on the previous slides, about uh, new entrants to the to the um, to the firm, new new employees could be left out a bit in the uh, in the cold. Next slide, please, Christy. So, just in terms of psychiatric injury, um, there's a case of Bailey and Devon partnership, which uh, effectively re-emphasises the importance of risk assessment. So, particularly for psychiatric injury, risk assessment really important. Um, and hopefully the risk assessment will identify a number of control measures. And we just put up some basic points there on the slide. So you've got things like ensuring not to a higher workload, breaks during the working day. Uh, the employee knows where to go for help or counselling. The employee knows where to go for stress management policies. The lines of communication are open and clear. And also you as an employer potentially monitoring the performance of the, um, the employee overall. Next slide, please, Christy. So we come to this case, the, the, the leading case or the majority of the, the law or the propositions in terms of psychiatric injury come from this case of Sutherland and Hatton. There has been a few tweaks along the, the way, but uh, Lady Justice Hale put forward some propositions for, um, for liability in terms of psychiatric injury. Um, there are a number of propositions, some of which are still current, some of which aren't, but I've just put up there a very sort of basic, um, uh, set of points for you to look at if you wanted a more of an aid memoir if a, if a case does come to you as a reminder as to what to look for. So first of all in terms of foreseeability, general foreseeability is not enough, you need reasons as to why you as an employer should have identified risk to a particular employee, um, i.e. red flags. So the kind of things that you might be looking for is um, emails late into the night, difficulty with colleagues, fall off in production, um, what you're really looking for is rather than one-off events, you're looking for pattern behaviour. So if you start seeing an employee that's changed the way they work or changed their behaviour and possibly even had um, physical illness that might be related to um, stress, then uh, if you've got a pattern, then you need to start looking at uh, whether or not um, and there's a risk here for you. OK, so after that, we move on to reasonable steps or breach of duty. So it's down to the claimant to show that reasonable steps could have been taken by the employer. So these types of cases are quite difficult for an employee to actually prove, um, but they do take quite a bit of legwork as you as a, an employer to get the right evidence in place. So in terms of reasonable steps, we'll come on to those in a moment. Um, the other point is causation. So even if you as an employer are in breach of your duty, the breach must still give rise to a clinically recognisable psychiatric injury. And that's normally where the, the medical evidence comes in and you end up with lengthy medical reports from psychiatrists um, detailing what the cause is. But it's just important to get it right. If you end up instructing an expert as a defendant, uh, make sure you know what the expert's going to cover uh, in terms of causation, because there's some really good points in there for you as a defendant. Uh, other factors that you might want to take into account are pre-existing conditions for the um, claimant employee and issues outside of work. And ultimately, if you did find yourselves at trial, you can still argue arguments in terms of apportionment. So you might say it's a certain percentage related to the job, another percentage to home, home life, and another percentage to pre-existing conditions. So you can certainly reduce your ultimate exposure as, a, um, as an employer. Next slide, please, Christy. So in terms of practical steps, what might you take? Um, counselling itself, a support system, counselling is really good. Um, it's probably not sufficient in itself to defend a claim for psychiatric injury in its entirety, but it's certainly good, particularly if it's independent and anonymous. Really what you're looking for overall is a system of support. So there's a good line of communication. Who does the employee speak with if they've got any issues? Contact details are freely available. Occupational health, so make sure they've got access to occupational health and know how to get that access and potentially independent assistance. So if, if you have an independent firm that deals with um, occupational health or deals with supporting with psychiatric issues, then that can also be um, good. And then just you as an employer seeking to, uh, to monitor the work of the employee and management of workflow. Next slide, please, Christy. Okay, just a brief note on bullying or harassment. This really crosses over with employment law. Um, but there's a couple of points here that I think are quite important. First of all, if you can make sure the employees are aware of what constitutes bullying, harassment. So have you got a, a policy in place that the employees know about what is acceptable behaviour? Perhaps even more so when they're working remotely, because the tendency is you think out of sight, out of mind. But clearly that's not the case. And you're still at work and you're still an employee and you should behave. You know, accordingly. Um, also consider about uh, bullying harassment externally, so it may not necessarily be internally, 
it might come from an external supplier, a third party organisation. So just be aware that sometimes these claims do emanate from um, external um, sources. And then the other point or key point really to mention is in terms of reporting. So if an employee comes to you make or wants to make a report of bullying, harassment, um, what are the next steps? Where do they go to? Uh, what do they do? And what do you do as an organisation? Try and make sure the, the process itself is reasonably clear and, uh, and transparent. Next uh, slide, please, Christy. So in terms of defending home working cases or uh, remote working cases, um, just as you normally would, the same principles apply. So where possible, treat each accident as a potential claim. So look at it in terms of the accident circumstances. Do you accept what the um, claimant, the employee is telling you? Do you have any concerns? What evidence have you got? What evidence can you pull together? In terms of liability, again, the legal position, just the same as before with a, a workplace um, case. So looking at duty of care breach of duty and an injury as a result of that breach of um, duty. Duty of care usually is made out of the employee. The breach of duty, that's used for the battleground, so where we come in with the risk assessments, the training, the procedures in place that you have as an employer. And then finally, the injury is normally made out on the medical evidence. Next slide, please, Christine. So in terms of contemporary evidence, the sort of evidence that you would have or you have access to immediately after the the accident itself. Um, you may well have some primary evidence. So if there's a broken workstation, a broken table or ch chair, uh, where possible, ask the employee to retain that or at least take photographs so you can see what's caused the injury. Or if it's trailing wires or something that's not quite right with the workstation, ask them to take some photographs uh, as long as they're in a fit state to, um, to do that. Um, telephone or video call investigations, we think will come more to the, more to the fore. Um, and also with colleagues, because it may well be that the claimant employee has gone on to tell colleagues about what happened, and that may be a slightly different version of events to what they're telling you. So that's, um, that's important. The other thing is culture, um, the importance of reporting accidents as soon as possible, ideally the same day. Um, because otherwise you end up with a scenario where it runs on for a couple of weeks, then the employee puts in a uh, or reports an accident and it's very difficult then to backtrack. So wherever possible, you want to be putting in a culture or uh, emphasising a culture with your employees of reporting accidents and near misses as soon as they, um, they occur. And then the last point put on the photographs. The other point is the accident report form. So you may well want to email this out to your um, employees have the accident and you can either complete it or get them to complete parts of it um, via the video conference call. But again, it's a good account of what's happened, but bearing in mind it's in their words. So if you don't agree with it or you have some concerns or colleagues have raised issues, make sure that you have your own comments either on the accident report form or you have a separate form where you say, well, that's what I've been told, but I don't necessarily accept it. Because ordinarily then if you're running a case in two or three years down the line, you've only got one account. It's what the claimant says. Then quite often, as I'm sure you will see with, with previous cases at trial, judges then just accept that as face value evidence. And then unfortunately it's more difficult to, um, to backtrack. Next slide, please, Christine. So in terms of pre-accident evidence, so this is the evidence that you may well have on your systems um, in terms of defending homeworking or hybrid types cases. Uh, it's a good point to set out the investigation process before you even get anywhere near an accident. So just make sure that when your uh, employees are working remotely, they're aware of what the investigation process will be. The fact that they need to notify you as soon as the incident occurs, the fact they may be subject to a uh, telephone or video conference call to discuss the circumstances, just as you would do face to face ordinarily uh, with your organisations if you're, if you're meeting them um, face to face. But if you set that out from day one, then they're aware of what their um, obligations are. Are. Then you'll be looking for things like uh, the training records that make sure they're relevant and adequate and up to date for that particular activity. Risk assessment, the famous last words, risk assessment, um, ideally signed off by the, um, the employee, the claimant, if at all possible. Uh, records of any previous similar accidents is always useful. Hopefully it's nil, but even if it isn't nil, you might have an enhanced risk assessment responding to previous um, accidents, which again is good for you in, in terms of defensibility. And the other point I know that one of our um, clients is doing is pre-incident photographs of workstation. So in fact, they're taking a snapshot of um, how the employee's workstation looks. And then should an accident arise, then potentially we can do a comparison as to uh, what it was like before and what it was like um, afterwards. Um, in terms of um, discussions and well-being calls with employees, 
try and keep a, a diary or an electronic diary, at least in terms of um, team discussions, individual telephone calls, video calls, because these certainly help in terms of psychiatric cases, possibly so as well with um, any issues about uh, workstation equipment, but certainly from a psychiatric point, you can show that you've got a good contact, good communication with your employees that will help you defend um, cases. Mentioned workstation risk assessments, and then clear chain of command and reporting, setting out um, everything that's understood by the employee. Next slide, please, Christy. So evidence, uh, key evidence is um, first reporting. So what happened at home is very likely there won't be any witnesses or certainly any um, uh, un unbiased witnesses. Um, so the chances are um, that uh, you'll just have the claimant's account. So you need to know who's reporting the incident, uh, when it occurred and why. We'd also recommend that at this stage, you're taking down details such as who the claimant's line manager was and their colleagues, because again, in a couple of years time, if a case gets litigated, it can often be quite difficult to trace back who was working with that particular colleague, especially if they're working remotely, um, who their direct line manager was, that can become a bit of a gray area. Whereas if these details are noted down, then it makes it much more um, straightforward when you're trying to investigate a case and find out who was actually responsible for them and what they recall of this particular incident. Um, mentioned before on the previous slides about an investigation pack. So just flag them up, uh, electronic records. Always good to have an investigation pack wherever you can in terms of a um, accident. So in terms of you might put in their employees' photographs, um, employees' record or statement of um, accident circumstances. And then the, moving on to the employer investigation, we'd have things like um, colleague evidence, records of any similar accidents, risk assessment in place at the time of the accident. Again, that's really good to put in there so that we know which risk assessment was applicable and which control measures were in place. And then finally, any further action. So you may well have some further action. It could be retraining for the employee. It could be sending them a new desk or a new uh, desk tidy, or whatever it might be. Um, but if you put that in there, it shows that you as a employer have got a good, um, a good ethos there, a good uh, philosophy of dealing with, um, with dealing with accidents and potentially claims. And then back to work discussions and interviews. Um, if it's electronic, then hopefully it should be a lot easier to store. It shouldn't cause you, cause you any issues in terms of storage. Initially, we'd probably say at least six years, but if you ever find yourself with an accident or potentially a claim, um, more than happy to discuss any retention issues um, which may arise because depending on what the employee was do excuse me, doing or their age, um, it, could be, uh, it could be advisable to retain the documentation for longer. Okay, next slide, please, Kristen. So in terms of contrib or causation arguments, if you look at contrib, first of all, um, all the same arguments would apply. So you've got your trips and slips at home in terms of loose cables or spillages, manual handling, if they've been um, properly trained, have they followed their um, training and the risk assessments. Uh, workstation, display screen, again, uh, we go down to risk assessment um, and training. Um, just a quick note on there in terms of stress claim, I mentioned other causative factors. Uh, there may even be an argument for contrib about whether they've um, failed to um, respond or to uh, undertake their own medical um, um, assessments, their own uh, seeking medical attention um, in, a, in a reasonable pe period of time or timescale. That's always worth considering. Um, briefly, just a quick mention about COVID-19 source. So in terms of these cases, um, I'm sure they'll, they will no doubt it will come out in case law. Um, in terms of the, uh, the full tests, in terms of where we go with, with these types of cases. But the first point we think from an um, employee's perspective is these are very difficult cases to prove in terms of causation. So it'd be difficult for the employee to say, I caught COVID in my office or at my workplace and not at home, not in the garden, not out shopping, whatever else they might be doing or even socialising. So that's a good point for you as a defendant. Um, again, moving on, breach of duty is probably going to be quite difficult for them to show, given that it's fairly straightforward or reasonably straightforward for an employer to provide things like um, or ensure things like social distancing, cleaning materials, um, that kind of thing. So it should be relatively straightforward for you as an employer. And also um, in terms of desk space and where you get where your employees are going to sit post um, post COVID. So that's just looking at reasonable practical steps. Secondary victims, yeah, we flagged up before about this asbestos argument. Yeah, certainly I think that will happen, I suspect, to some, uh, some degree. And then also long COVID. Um, so you may well have an employee that contracts COVID, whatever that might be, but they might come to you and say, I'm struggling, I want some adjustments, I need some assistance, I, I need a reduced workload, whatever else. Um, and in terms of what adjustments you, you can make, again, that's a consideration. 
Just the final point in terms of causation, um, the Industrial Injuries Advisory Council. So they've effectively said that there's currently insufficient evidence to justify benefits being paid out under the scheme of it's a government um, body, benefits for recognisable occupational um, diseases. Um, and they're basically saying at the moment there's insufficient evidence to justify that COVID is a, um, a occupational uh, disease which their scheme covers. Um, so that certainly helps you again in terms of, um, of causation. Okay, next slide please, Christine. So finally, in terms of going forward, um, I think the key things are going to be, or are at the moment, the contact with the employee, so making sure that you have daily, weekly, whatever it might be, uh, contact, making sure there's informal and formal contact, and the employee themselves are fully aware of the lines of um, communication, and that you as an organisation have got a good culture of dealing with any issues raised by the employee. And then it really does come down to risk assessments. I know we've mentioned them before, but they are key in terms of defensibility for um, for, client, for employers' liability cases. So making sure that um, you've got the right risk assessments in place, being aware the courts are probably going to consider there's greater emphasis on the employee, uh, sorry, it's the employer, given that you're giving them more responsibility at um, home. If you can, get the employee to sign off the risk assessment and understand what's expected of them. And the same with the um, training records. Okay. It's a bit of a canter through, but hopefully you'll have taken some um, practical advice or guidance in terms of uh, dealing with accidents and um, claims. Um, thank you very much for listening. I hope you got something out of it. Thank you, Christy, for the slides. And I'll, um, I'll now hand you back to Siobhan. Thanks very much, Tim. Um, excellent uh, summary of the, uh, of the law around um, this particular area. We're, no, none of us are seeing huge numbers of claims arising out of homeworking, contracting COVID or, or any of the other aspects around it yet. But I do think it very much is watch this space and, and we expect that claimant lawyers will be um, getting their act together as we speak and, uh, and claims will, uh, will manifest themselves in, in due course. So if obviously if any of us can, can help, if uh, that st starts to occur in your organisations, then you only have to ask and you know where we are. I think there's been a couple of questions going through and um, some of them have been answered in the chat, but um, it might just be, um, we've got a couple of minutes if we can just deal with one that's come through for, for you, Tim. Um, somebody's asked that with regard to the um, risk assessments on display screen regulations that you mentioned that the HSE website's got some in useful information on, but when does temporary become permanent? You mentioned that there's not necessarily a need to um, reassess workstations if people are only temporarily working somewhere else but when it becomes permanent they do and the, the question is specifically asked you know people have been working at home for over a year now so um when does when does it become permanent can you have some thoughts around that yeah that's a really really good question really good point um i, I think ultimately it's going to come to say well what's going to happen moving forward so are they going to stay as um hybrid or home workers or working remotely or are they going to come full-time back into the office I suspect in reality, from a practical perspective, most people I suspect will end up um, working a degree of remotely and a degree in the office, in which case I'll be saying you probably want to be looking at your risk assessments, particularly now as we've had a year of um, working from working remotely or working from home. So I would suggest that uh, if the long term aim or goal is that as we move forward and come out of the pandemic, people, your employees will be coming back into the office, but they'll also be spending some time at home, then I would suggest then you need to start looking at the, um, the risk assessments. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Um, there was another question as well that I think um, Phil Farrow went back to the, to the questioner on the chat, but just in case people haven't um, uh, read that, I think it might just be worth raising again, if that's okay. So address to you. Phil Farrer, there was um, a question about the, the point that you'd made about people working from second homes abroad or, or even you know, in other parts of the country. Um, and the, the question is, do you see it likely that the ability to cross borders for recruitment will expand, not just working in second homes? Yeah, thanks, Siobhan. Uh, I, I don't see there being any immediate acceleration in, in, in the next three to five years as such, but I do think it's going to be a growing challenge. I mean, I think there's employment uh, law issues. Uh, if an organisation has no presence in a country but is using employees in that country, which employment law uh, takes president? What access would the employee have and protection would be against the organisation? So I, I definitely think it's not going to be something in the short term we're going to see. 
but I think it's something that's going to increase. And I think the questioner raised a really good response back into my question, which was in those area of uh, maybe ge geography or sector specific where it's difficult to recruit people, uh, agile working, uh, I, people working from home abroad might be a potential solution. Uh, I think it could be really relevant if more than one language is required in the role. I think it is interesting, and I, I think if you if you look at the outsourcing that many commercial businesses have right now, um, Aon has, I know, and various other insurance firms have as well, where where they have looked at other countries due to that skill set um, that is there and the efficiencies that that arise. So whether or not that is going to reflect itself in the public sector, I think is a watch this space. Uh, I suppose. Thank you very much. Well, um, there may be some more questions, but we really have run out of time now. So I think it just um, leaves me to say thank you very much to all the speakers, to Andrew, Mark, Tim, Phil and Phil. And thank you all uh, for, for joining us and for, for listening and watching our presentation today. Please do uh, take part in the poll, which helps us to improve our sessions and give you what you want for future sessions. Thank you all and goodbye. <laughs>